Thank you so much. I'm glad you're here today. We are not Cubs fans. I said, what are you doing wearing all that Cubs gear? He's like, when in Rome. I was like, well, you're not in Rome. Take it off. That's like the only sport I actually follow is baseball. And I am a Kansas City Royals fan. Yes. You're like, where is that? It's in Missouri, by the way. And, uh, but anyway, we're so glad you're here. My name is Pastor Kelly. And um, actually, my husband today is in Chicago, not just to watch a baseball game. There's actually a purpose. Uh, this year, Brian and I got to mentor over four different churches, and they're all in the U.S. And uh, this is one of them in Chicago, but he makes a visit to every church throughout the year. So he's in Chicago today visiting a church there. And I just got to say, what an mo awesome moment to get to love on another pastor, encourage him, tell him it's going to be okay, you can do this, give him some insight. So that's what he's doing today. He's just there encouraging them. So thank you guys for still being here. He'll be back next week, don't worry, to wrap up relationship goals. But, um, but I'm here today. So yes. And I do what any good wife would do when her husband leaves. I turn up the thermostat. Yes, I did. Not only at home, but at the church. Yes, I did. I said, bump it up, people. My hands are not going to go numb today. So yeah, so if you don't freeze, if you sweat, well, just too bad. You'll, you'll, free, you'll be fine next week, and all the rest of us will be frozen again. So, But uh, we're so glad. And I always like to give honor where honor is due, and that is to my husband, um, who I completely adore. And I'm so thankful that he gave me this opportunity, and I love doing life with him, love doing ministry with him. And um, I still think back of the first time I met Brian, and uh, we were so young, way back in the day, and I met him at a basketball game at Bible College, and I'll never forget, I was on like the fourth row up, and I felt like he just kind of jumped through the air and landed on the bleacher, and he's like, hey, everybody, I'm Brian! And that was my first way of meeting him, and I was like, oh, this kid is very loud and very hyper. And it felt like the whole basketball game, he was just couldn't sit still, couldn't sit still. He's like, what are you guys doing? What are you gonna, I mean, he was just all over to the point where I thought, oh my goodness, does he need medicine? Like, what is wrong with this boy? He is so hyper. Come to find out, I think he was just excited to be away from home, had a little too much freedom. But I'll never forget what he was wearing the first time I met him. I know you guys want to know this, right? Everybody wants to know this. He was wearing uh, these green polyester bell bottoms that were like a size 40. Okay, he had like this belt wrapped around him, he had this tight yellow shirt, and his hat, I'm not kidding, his hat was a toaster cover. Like, you know the covers you put on a toaster? That was his hat. And I'm thinking, oh, he has no money. <laughs> oh, but yeah, back then, shopping at Goodwill was the cool thing to do, and he literally embraced that culture. It's a little too much. But, uh, but anyway, so that was the first time I met Brian, and um, since then we became friends, and there was two things I knew about Brian right away. He loved life, and he loved Jesus, and that was good enough for me. And in the last 23, we've known each other for 25 years, we've been married almost 23 years. It has been fun. We have had some fun, that's for sure. But he is all over still. He has got a lot to do, and even planning vacations, it's so hilarious. Let's go here, let's go do this. I'm like, okay, let's, let's just pick one thing to do. So he loves to be adventurous. Anyway, so I'm thankful for him, thankful for our three beautiful daughters, my son, who likes to remind me that God is good, and he is, <laughs> that life is fun, and, um, and I'm so thankful God's protecting him. But, and also to our staff, um, who I love so much, they are so supportive and loving. I think six of them asked me if I wanted coffee today. Um, I know I don't need that much caffeine, but it's just their heart. Their heart is to serve. Their heart is to love you. I hope you know that. Um, and they are just dear to Brian and I. We couldn't do it without them. And um, I always like to brag on my, my team. Um, I'm not going to tell you who they are because they're mine. But, you know, I have people throughout the church that just hug me. I have my hug team. And some of them don't even know they're on my hug team, but they are. Where they just hug me, my advice team, my prayer team, people that I can text and just say, pray for me, and they do it. People that give me advice, and I'm like, how do I get through this with these girls? Not that they're a problem, but... And, people that give me advice that have done it before. I mean, I have a team of people. You've got to have people around you to do life with because you need them. And not, there's not one person out there that's supposed to do it all, right? That's, that's his job. But there's people in your life that can definitely share some wisdom if you let them. So have a team of people. Find people that just can hug you because it's great. But today, I'm going to confess something to you 
because um, if you don't know, um, I don't have Facebook. I got rid of Facebook um, like a year ago. I'm not a big social media person, to be honest. I'm not on it. I don't have time. I don't have people got all this time to get on it. I just don't got time, and I forget about it, honestly. But I do have Instagram, which I forget about a lot. But the funny thing about Instagram, so I, I discovered something a few months ago, and my family is so annoyed that I discovered it. But I discovered I can follow animals. Oh my gosh, it's so much fun, y'all. They're so cute and they're so funny and I'll be laughing. I'm like, look at this baby elephant. My kids are like, oh my word, we don't wanna see another elephant or a monkey. I mean, it's just so much fun because there's no drama with animals, you know? It's just cuteness overload. It makes me laugh and my husband's even like, I mean, I really follow very few people. It's mostly all animals, but it's okay. And my, I didn't even show my husband. He saw a video that I'm going to actually use today that sets up our sermon. And of course, it's of an animal. He's like, you are seriously going to show an animal? I said, yes, I am. And you're not here to tell me no. So I'm going to do it. But before I do, um, I do have one special picture. Oh, yes, that's my dog, y'all. It has nothing to do with the sermon today at all. And I don't care. It's just, I just want to show you my dog. Isn't he cute? This is Toby. He's the love of, I mean, above, under my children, of course. But then, you know, Toby is, so, oh, he's so sweet. That was his birthday party. I threw him a birthday party. Yes, I did. And it was for me, really. It was so much fun. But that's my Toby. As you can see, I just love animals. They're so much fun. But, um, you know, the reason why people say, why don't you post anything about your kids? Because with my girls, there's so much approval it has to go through before it's posted that by the time I get to the third approval, I'm over it. The moment is gone, I'm done, I'm like, forget it, nobody's gonna see that we're a happy family because I'm not, you know, my eyes are closed, I don't like the way I'm turned, my squinty, my hair, I'm like, I'm done, I'm done. So I just post pictures of my dog because he don't care, he don't care. But I have a video today that I want you to watch that's gonna set up our sermon today. Y'all, that's just too cute. He's like, thank you. Look at him. He's saying thank you. I can feel it in my heart. And that's what I do. That's what I, I watch animals being rescued. I watch them. It's just so much. I saw these two penguins that they were holding little flippers walking together. I'm like, oh my gosh, couple goals. It was so cute. It was just, I'm telling you, that's all I do. I just watch animals and I read my Bible too. But, and then I watch animals. It's just so much fun. But that sets up our message today. Let me give you the title of the sermon today if you're taking notes. We're in our relationship goals series, and today's title of our sermon is, What's the Arrangement in Your Relationship with Jesus? What's the arrangement in your relationship with Jesus? Basically, who's making the calls? Who's making the calls in your relationship? And I'm going to show you an equation that only you can answer, and whether you answer it honestly or not, doesn't matter, it's between you and God. Is it more of you and less of him? Or is it less of you and more of him? Which is it in your relationship? It's one or the other. Is it all about me? And once in a while, I'll include him when it's a big decision. But all the little decisions, I'm good, God. I got it. I got it. I got it. Or do you go to God for everything? Say, God, help me today. Let my day be blessed. Let my week be blessed. Let me start my week off right. You're in church. You're starting your week off right. Who's making the calls in your relationship with Jesus? And that's what we're talking about today, is that. Now, we're going to start off with a scripture today in James 4, 7 through 8. All scripture that I use today is read from the NLT, if you want to know. But James 4, 7 through 8 says, So humble yourself before God. Resist. Resist means to prevent, to strive against, to refrain from, to stop fighting, to oppose it. But resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Come close to God, and he'll come close to you. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And if you don't know, today I'm preaching to all those that maybe have had a hard time resisting something. Maybe you're currently having a hard time resisting something. 
refraining from something. Maybe you're constantly fighting, like, I can do this myself. I can do this myself. And if you, in case you didn't know today, I'm preaching to everybody, including myself. And if Pastor Brian was here, it'd be preaching to him too, because we all deal with having a hard time resisting, thinking we can do it ourselves. And if you may be sitting there thinking, not me, not me, well, the day's young. Don't, don't worry. It'll come. It'll come. But this is what I love about our church, is if you can't talk about your struggles here, then what's the point? Because here, it's okay that you don't have it all together. It's okay you're not okay. It's okay that you have a hard time resisting things. It's okay if you're dealing with an addiction. It's okay if you just got out of jail. It's okay if you got in a fight with your wife last night. It's okay that you feel like you're failing as a parent. It's okay. And that's why Destination Church is here. It's to remind people that the best is still yet to come. And it's not, it doesn't matter what you came from. It only matters where you're going. And that's what today is about. So, um, you know, many of you um, probably, I, I've shared my story bits and pieces throughout different events that we've had through L2 or the Ladies' Night or something. But, you know, um, if you don't know, I wasn't raised in a church. Um, I didn't get saved until I was probably about, I think I was 15, 16. I can't remember the exact age. But, you know, I remember when Brian and I got married, and, um, and he wanted to go into ministry, and I did too. I knew, I knew God had a calling on my life. I don't know what that meant, really. But I knew, I was like, let's go do this. And we became youth pastors. I'm like, this is awesome. We're youth pastors. What is that? I don't know what we're doing. We're going to pastor teenagers. I'm like, oh, okay, yay. Love, no, I love teenagers. But I remember, um, I still remember, like, literally the first year of that. And I was scared to death. I remember I wasn't for sure how to dress. I didn't know, you know, how to talk. I didn't even, I mean, so what I would do is I just would watch everybody else, you know, and I'd watch the pastor's wife. And I noticed one Sunday she never crossed her legs on the front row. She always crossed her ankles. So I would, I'm going to cross my ankles. Then that's what I do. And then I would watch her out the corner of my eye worshiping. She'd always go halfway. So I would go halfway because I'm like, that's got to be more godly, I guess. <laughs> and if, you know, if she wore a certain, I would try to, you know, that's what I should wear. And she was always so happy, so I was always happy. And that worked for about a year. And then year two, I did that, and year three, and I, and I kept doing that. So I got to the point where I realized I wasn't happy. And to the point where I was like, this whole ministry thing is not real fun because <laughs> I'm just walking around like this and this and this and how do I do, you know. It, I was just copying. I didn't know what I was doing. I just kind of thought I had to be nice and meet everyone's need. Whatever one, anyone needed, you go do it because that's what you're here to do. And I would do the best I could, but I felt like I was never quite enough. Like somebody would say, well, I mean, that was good, but it could have been better. And I was constantly struggling Constantly struggling, feel like I wasn't worthy, I wasn't good enough, if this, if I would have had that, if I would have had a better this, if I would have done this. Constantly struggling with that. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is we're going to talk about some struggles that we all deal with. We all deal with weaknesses. We all have them. And admitting it is the hardest part sometimes, because for years I thought I had no weaknesses. I was fine. I got this I was a fighter, if you, can't, if you don't know that about me, but I tend to think I can just fight my way through it and I'll be fine. Just suck it up and that's what you do. And I tried that for eight years. So I got to the point where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore, babe. Sorry, but this isn't fun. I don't like who I've become. And this whole ministry thing, I don't think it's for me. And I remember facing that between me and God. And I remember having that moment where God literally showed me, you're right. You're miserable because you're so full of you. There's no room for me. I was constantly, what do I need to do? What do I need to say? How do I need to dress? How do I need to look? You know, constantly in my head of what I needed to be when I never let God show me who he wanted me to be. And 
all he wanted me to do was love people, but I couldn't love other people because I was too in love with how I looked, how I was supposed to dress, how I was supposed to talk, how I was supposed to smile, how I was supposed to be at every event. I was so full of what I thought I needed to be that there was no room for me to love anybody else. Let me give you your one thing to know today. Your one thing to know is surrendering is not giving up the fight. Surrendering is giving God space to work. So I reached this point where I was miserable. I didn't want to do ministry. I loved my husband, loved my kids, but I, was, I loved Jesus still. I had nothing to do. I still loved Jesus. I just didn't want to do that in the church thing. And I remember facing that where I felt like I was tired, y'all. I was fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting to the point where God was like, you can stop. And I stopped. And I said, okay, I'm going to just give this to you, God, because I don't know what to do anymore. And God said, finally, because in your weakness is when God can move in. That's the space. That space is God's and God's alone. That's his space to work in you when you finally surrender your weakness. Now, I brought the, the, there's a purpose for these today. (laughs) And um, I grew up on a farm. Uh, My mom remarried when I um, was probably like 11 or 12. And we moved out to a farm. And I remember we had um, Bob Wire that kept you know, everything. My parents had 300 acres and we had some cows. And I remember I was introduced to four wheelers. Woohoo! When I first moved to the farm, I thought, this is awesome. And I tend to, um, I drove very nice and careful and told my girls that. I was so super safe. <laughs> Not really. I was the worst. I should never have been given a four wheeler. But I had this idea one day because there was this bob wire fence and there was this one piece of bob wire that had a handle, and that was the gate. Now, it was electric, so yeah, you don't grab it, but that's how we would, you know, undo the hook, and you lay it down, drive through, and hook it back. Well, one day, someone had laid it on the ground. So me, being the smart 12-year-old driving a four-wheeler, thought, well, if I go really fast, I can just go right over that bob wire. So I thought, speed it up, right? So I speed it up, I go as fast as I can over the bob wire. It didn't quite work out. <laughs> I got about a little, and it jerked me back, and the bob wire had gotten all caught up in the four-wheeler, right? So my parents weren't super happy, but, and it did a little bit of damage, but I, I thought I was good. It was just one little bob wire. I mean, what's the big deal? Especially if I go really fast, then we'll be fine. But come to find out, I had done so much damage to the four-wheeler that, and it was all on the inside. You couldn't, because I looked at it, I was like, the four-wheeler's fine. I mean, that's, you know, no, when you, my dad put it up on a jack and he got under it and it was all twisted and it was around the wheels. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize what I had done. But that's the way sin kind of is in our life. And that's why I brought this today. Because you see, I even had to face that in my own life that I was so entangled in sin. And I love this definition. I love this definition. And the Greek word for entangled means implecio. And I love this definition. It says, means to be involuntarily interlaced to the point of immobility. You can be so, I was so into myself that I had lost all mobility. I was tangled up in this sin of thinking, I got this. I know what I'm doing. I'm good enough. I'll smile and everyone will think I'm good. If my hands are here, that means I love Jesus, right? That's what I thought. I was, but I was so tangled up in this that I didn't know up from down, side to side. I did not know what direction I was even going to the point where I was doing nothing for God because I lost all mobility. It had, the sin had taken everything away from me, and I was just living life for myself. Wow. How's everyone going to think I'm look? How's that? Make sure my kids are well-behaved. Make sure the girls have their dresses on and they look well-behaved. I was, that's where I was. And let me show you. I'm going to take you into the Bible now because let me tell you about the Word of God, you guys. We don't just refer to the Word of God because that's what we do because we're a church. The Word of God will change your life. It will, if you read it, 
If you read it, it'll change your life. So, but I'm going to show you three stories, and I love these stories because they're going to, I'm going to take you down three people's stories that they got to this point where they realized they were so entangled in their sin and what they thought was right or wrong, it didn't matter, that they had lost all mobility and they were doing nothing for God. But then you're going to watch how God takes that away off their life and changes everything. Let's go to Joshua chapter 2. Um, I love this story. It's about Rahab. Joshua 2, I'm going to read pretty quickly, 1 through 7. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp of Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out, came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab. And they stayed there that night. But somebody told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come in here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come to your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, yes, the men were here earlier, but I don't know where they went or where they're from. And they left the town at dusk, and as the gates were about to close, so they're gone. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you'll probably catch up to them. Actually, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath bundles of flax that she had laid out. So the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. As soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. Let me tell you about Rahab. Here she is, prostitute. She had a reputation. Her house had a reputation. People knew that men came and went. She knew, everyone knew that. Even in the Bible, it's documented that she's lying. I mean, that's terrible. Like, I'm so glad people don't write down my lies. Not that I've ever lied. But I mean, she's like, yeah, the men were here, but they're gone, whatever. I mean, she's like totally lying in the Bible. But this is where Rahab was. She thought she was unworthy. She's just a person. She's like, it doesn't matter if I'm lying. It doesn't matter because, you know, I'm a prostitute. Nobody cares about me. But this is what she does. She's brave. She hides these spies. And I love verse 12. I love verse 12 because she says to these men, she's so, it doesn't say she's weak. In fact, this proves to you she's very bold and she's very strong. She says to these, men, these two spies when they're about to leave, now she's now swear to me. I love that she says that. I think she says that to them because she's had so many men break their promises. And so she looks at these two men and she says, swear to me that the Lord will be kind to me and my family since I've helped you. Give me a guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you're going to let me live with my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and my family and their families. This is what blows my mind about Rahab. She is not pleading just for herself. She's pleading for the generations to follow. She wants freedom. She wants freedom of thinking she's a nobody, but she wants freedom for the generations to follow because she knows, she knows, she doesn't want that sin to carry to her the next generation or the next generation. Rahab knew that repeating self-destructive patterns will never reap a different harvest for her family. And she was ready to change that for her family. So just like that video of that little seal, and I know it was a cute little video, but it does have a purpose. You have to eventually, you can fight. Rahab was fighting me and she was tough. I never said she was weak. She was tough. But she got to the point where she was stopped. She surrendered and she said, okay, I'm gonna let God be God. And I'm gonna stop fighting and I'm gonna admit that I'm a little weak so he can free me. And that's what Rahab did. And in Joshua 6, 20 through 23, when the people heard, this is the awesome part about Rahab's story. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horn, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed. The Israelites charged in. They completely destroyed everything in it. The women, young, men, old, cattle, sheep. I mean, they took it all out. Meanwhile, Joshua said to the two spies, keep your promise. Go to the prostitute's house, bring her out along with her family. Can you imagine? Now, you got to think, this is like the story of the walls of Jericho. You know, march around seven times, the walls are going to fall down. Okay. Where was Rahab's home? In the wall. And yet, here she walks out with her family. She's like, oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah, I, I, just, I could just see her held, her head up high, thinking, no more. No more. I have my mobility. I'm back. God's got something for me. I've got a purpose. I'm walking out of here. I'm no longer entangled. I no longer think I'm unworthy. God's got a future for me. I would love to see that moment, Rahab. And now, I feel like, you know, because I'm a little bit of a fighter too. I just bet she'd walk out. Yeah, you see me. Mm -hmm. Got my family. Got my family. And we're, we're headed down a new path now. And what's crazy about Rahab, she's mentioned throughout the Bible about her faith. She is actually the great, great grandmother of King David. I mean, she has a future, y'all, all because she stopped and surrendered, stopped fighting, and she surrendered. Let's go to Job. Now, you know, y'all, if you know me at all, you know I like Job. Brian always, I always say, I can't wait to get him. I'm going to meet Job. He's going to be the first one. Brian's like, you got something for Job. And I said, well, you're my number one. But Job, I mean, come on. Because I just can't wait to meet Job. If you go back and read the book of Job, here he is a wealthy man. He, and it even says in the Bible, he's blameless, he's upright, he's a good guy. What a nice guy. He had 10 children. He did his best to avoid evil. Now he spoiled his kids a bit. You know, they had to have the latest camel. He would go get it. They kind of got whatever they wanted, right? So, but he was always like, don't, it's okay. At night, I'll sacrifice the animal just in case they sent. Because, you know, I care about my kids. But so he was a good guy. He loved, he knew God. But this is what happens. All of a sudden, in the first chapter of Job, I mean, it goes from he's blameless and upright to like. I mean, the bottom falls out. In Job 1.14, I mean, the, the Sibans attacked and stole all of his oxen and all of his donkeys, killed some of his servants, fire fell from the sky, burned up the sheep and more of his servants. The Chaldeans attacked and stole Job's Camels killing even more servants. A mighty wind swept in the desert and destroyed the house and killed all of Job's children. And then, to make matters worse, then Job is filled with sores from his head to his toe. Now, I think when I read this book in the Bible, I think why it touches me so much, because I feel like Job had a sin. I mean, he was covered in suffering. But you know what's crazy about Job's suffering? It was given to him. It was given. And that broke my heart. I'm like, why? And when I deal with people in our church, they've lost children. They have cancer. They lose loved ones. They have sicknesses. I think, why? They're such good people. They love God. They do good things. And I think... This is the only thing that brings me peace is when I read Job's story and Job goes through 42 chapters. He never once curses God, but he does ask why a lot. Why? Why? And I don't know if he ever really got the answer, but what I love about verse all the way down, to, I mean, this is like the end of Job. Okay, this would be me too. It's like takes me 42 chapters to learn the hard way. I finally get it. Job at the very end says, and this has just changed my life. I had only heard about you, but now I've seen you. I've seen you now. Because see, I think Job knew God. He loved God. But now him and God were like, they had a connection that nobody could explain. And why Job had to go through all that suffering to get there, I'll never be able to understand that. But all I know is that Job at the very end of chapter 42 says, but now I've seen you. I've seen you now. And me and you, we're like this. And I don't understand, but I, I'm done. I'm done trying to ask why I'm done. The suffering is no longer who I am. I now am yours, whatever you want to do with me. This is what I love. This is how God blessed him in 42, 5, he said, or 42, 10. Job prayed for his friends because he had some terrible friends, if you go back and read. Um, the Lord restored Job's fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him back twice as much as he ever had. Let's go to Peter. Luke 22, 54 through 62. Now, let me read the description of Peter because we've all heard the great stories of Peter. Peter walked on the water. Peter's such a good guy. But let me read an explanation of Peter. Peter is the kind of guy who thinks before he speaks. 
He's very headstrong. He sometimes would tell Jesus what to do. Very outspoken. And he was prone to get excited and act before thinking. Now, I won't have you raise your hand if that sounds like you. But, you know, Peter dealt with pride. And he dealt with it in the sense of he thought, I got this. I can do this. I'm good enough. I can figure this out. I'm a smart man. I'm, I'm a strong man. I can do this. And what's crazy is he didn't have it all together. In Luke 22, 54 through 62. So they arrested him. This is where they arrested Jesus. And they're going to crucify him. They led him to a high priest home, and Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man is one of Jesus's followers. Peter denied it. No, woman. He said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, I'm not. Peter restored After an hour later, somebody else came and said, this must be one of them because he's a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately he was still speaking and the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. He said, oh, this is what Jesus warned me about. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times like you don't even know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. Now here's poor Peter. I feel like when he was at this point of being entangled, I can imagine where it started wrapping around him when he was saying things to himself like, what did you just do? Man, you just screwed up. What were you thinking? Jesus has done so much for you and look what you did. How embarrassing, how shameful. Where I feel like Peter was here to the point where he couldn't move anymore because he was, said he wept bitterly because he realized that he had failed. And he was stuck in this entanglement of just feeling like there's no way God can ever use me now. The person that loved me, I just shut out of my life. But let's remember, when we what? Surrender. That's when God can use us. And Peter had that moment. I love it in the book of John where Jesus is on the water and Peter, and he asked Peter, how many times do you love me? Three, he asked him three times. The same number of the times that Peter denied Jesus. Isn't that awesome how God, sometimes it takes some of us three times, 10 times, that's okay. And this is what I want you to know about Peter. After Peter surrendered and said, it's not about me, it really is about you, then God was able to take Peter's life. What's amazing about Peter, he's described as the rock, the rock in which the church is built on. Peter goes in and starts preaching and people getting saved the day of Pentecost. I mean, you can read all these amazing things about Peter, but it all goes back to when his pride had to finally be taken off of him and he had to surrender, right? And let's, I'm gonna give you your one thing to do and I'm gonna show you very quickly through your one thing to do. Because in all of these stories, in Rahab and Job and Peter and in my own life, this is what your one thing to do is. You've gotta stop fighting. Do you know it takes more strength to stop fighting? Because it's your face that has to kick in. That's hard. Especially if you don't like to wait. (laughs) Or you think, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. That was me, I got this, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing, I'm just gonna do what everybody else does. I got this. Till you reach the point where you're so exhausted because you've been fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and then you don't even like who you are. And I remember facing that in my life and thinking back to the day I got saved, thinking I am not, don't have a clue what I'm doing. And God said, that's okay. I don't want you to, I just want you. And it's okay that I may not have wore the right dress or had the right Bible or knew how to hold my hands or knew always the right thing to do or to say because God was okay with that. He just wanted me to surrender and give myself back. So God wants us to stop fighting. He wants us to surrender and he wants us to give God the space because your weakness 
is God's space to work. And if you never admit you're weak, then you're admitting there's no space for God. And there's space for God. But you're first gonna have to surrender that weakness. And some of you may think, but my weakness is so embarrassing. Don't you think Peter felt that way? I mean, it's recorded in the Bible he denied Jesus, the poor guy. I mean, Rahab's lie is right there. She's like, do you have to print it? Can we just pretend it was there? It's right there. But it's to remind them that your weakness is when God can move in and do the work that only he can do. That's how good God is. So ask yourself again, who's making the calls in your relationship? Is it more of him and less of you? Because that's the way God wants. He wants you to come closer. Come closer. Give your weakness to God. I don't know where I would be today because you don't understand. After we youth pastored is when God gave us the, the, in our hearts to plant destination. Could you imagine if I stayed here and never let God use me again? I'm done with ministry. I can't do it. I'm never dressed right. I never say the right thing. I don't do the right thing. I'm unworthy. I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't, I'm done and walk away. I don't know where I would be today. I don't know if I'd be in the church. But I reached the point where I said, I am weak. I can't do this. I thought I could. I thought I was just strong enough. I could do it. White knuckle it through, right? And God said, no. But when I stopped and I surrendered and I said, God, I am weak and I need you to come in that space because only you, I don't want to fill that space. I'm going to try to fill that space. Well, if I just take one more class, right? If I take, you know, if I read the Bible front and back, then that'll get me through. No, that, that spot is only for God. That weakness is only his spot. And when you let him in to take that spot, He'll do anything. I, there's not a Sunday I don't walk in here and think, how? How? How do I get to do this? How do I get to do this? And God says, just because you let me in your weakness and you let me in and I now I can use you. And that's all it is. So we say, oh, how do you do it? There's no magic. There's no magic, there's no sequel formula. There's not, if you do this and that and this, and thank the Lord God freed me and I get to wear tennis shoes, right? Because I thought I had to wear fancy shoes and God said, no, freedom. I get to be who I am. Isn't that awesome? When you get to be who you are, and when you get to be who you are, you're gonna love people for who they are. And that's what it's about, you guys. It's about loving people the way they are because I don't want to be full of myself anymore. I want to love other people. And if you're so full of you, 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 you can't love those that Jesus wants to change their lives. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to pray about two things. We never have a Sunday where we don't ask if somebody's saved. And then we're going to pray that all of you have the strength to give your weakness and surrender it to God today. That's it. And we're going to walk away here and go get some lunch and have a great week. But listen, I want everyone to go ahead and stand. Go ahead and stand with me and close your eyes. You know, I still remember this day in my life. I was, like I said, I was 15, 16. And I could tell you, take you to the spot in Lawson, Missouri, a town of two, I think it's 2200 now, where I would knelt on a gym floor. It was a gym floor that had carpet. And I thought that was very strange. And it did not smell good either. But I remember kneeling down. And there was like folding, metal folding chairs. I'll never forget it. And they asked the question of who wants to ask Jesus into your heart? And I remember thinking to myself, I don't even know if this guy's real. Like I really truly did not know what I was doing, but I felt something kind of like doing this. I thought, well, maybe that is God. I'm going to try this out. I'm glad I tried it out. And I remember saying, okay, God, uh, I don't know if you're even real, but come in my heart. It probably wasn't a very good prayer. 
But I know Jesus heard it. And he came down in that little town. And he loved on a little girl who was so broken and so hurt and thought she could never do anything good in the world because she was so not smart enough, not good enough, doesn't even know the Bible yet. But thank the Lord that he came in my heart, he changed my life. And I remember walking out of that gym, never being the same, never being the same. And that's what our church is about. It's about people's lives getting changed. It's not about what you've done. It's not about where you've been. Believe me, I've been there. I've been there. I'm not good enough. I'm not. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. So that's the first thing. So everyone close your eyes and I'm gonna ask the question. Is there anybody here today? This is just you and God. This has nothing to do with the church. This is just you and God. And you say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. And I, I really want to try this out. Can you just raise your hand if that's you today? You're just saying, I just don't even know this Jesus person. And I, I want to ask him into your heart. Thank you. Yes, thank you. This is your day. This is your gym floor moment. You're never going to forget it. So I want, church, can we be a family right now so they don't feel lonely? Let's all pray this prayer. If you'll pray this with me. See, I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life and make heaven my destination. Amen. Can we celebrate those that had their gym moment? Now we're going to pray for all of us. Like I said, the day's young. If you don't feel like you're weak, don't worry. God will show you. Some of you may need to ask God, where's my weakness? And he will be very quick to show you. But can we just raise two hands? And I'm going to pray over you that you'll have the strength and the courage to surrender. Because it takes more faith to surrender than keep doing it on your own. God, right now, I am praying for all my brothers and sisters that have walked into this building or that are watching online. God, that feel like their weakness is just too big it's too much i've done too much god show them today god that you can do anything just like you did with peter and job and rahab god you can use anybody so give them the strength to allow you in to have the courage to give you their weakness so you can get in that space and do what only you can do And God, that's you're going to use them. You can use them to change lives, to change their neighbor's lives, to change a friend, a co-worker's God. You have a purpose for their life. So give them the strength and the courage to surrender and know that you love them and you love them so much. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for believing in me and coming in my weakness and working in my life, God. And everybody said, amen, amen. I hope you feel loved. I hope you feel encouraged. Don't miss next week. We're gonna wrap up relationship goals next week. It's Father's Day. But thank you guys for being here today. Make sure you smile at somebody today. Love on them. And uh, we hopefully we'll see you back next week. Welcome your... Uh- Hey everyone, thanks for watching the Destination Church YouTube channel. But don't stop there. Hit the like, the share button, and definitely subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with everything that we want to give you. Hey, if it's impacted your life, please pray about giving financially to help people find their destination in Christ. Hey, just know it's not about where you've been. It's where you're going that matters, and the best is yet to come.